Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on securing outgoing traffic. So let's take a deep breath and just have fun. So just a bit of introduction about ourselves. My name is Edie. I'm a software engineer working, on, uh, working at Airbnb on the cloud infra team. So you might have guessed I am a cat person. I love, I love cats. I have three lovely cats. And my hobbies in leisure time includes basketball, dancing, singing, and I actually try a lot of different things. And here together with me is my uh, dear teammate, Akshita. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshita, and uh, along with ED, I'm a software engineer at the cloud infrastructure team at Airbnb. And uh, I'm a hiking enthusiast and almost everything outdoors, including biking, paddle boarding, etc. And you can see the in the photo, we have the mighty Mount Rainier in my back. And yeah, just like my hike up this mountain, the Egress Gateway journey was hard, but very rewarding for me. And I'm really excited to share it with you today. Cool. So let's jump to, into the topic we have today. So we will go by what is egress, why do you need an egress, and how. In the how section, I will firstly talk from a high-level perspective on several architectures and then uh, choices, and then Akshita will take a deep dive into one specific solution that we chose using Envoy. Cool. Let's just quickly go through what is egress gateway. By definition, an egress gateway is a mechanism that manages and routes outbound traffic to exit and impact network. It's a pair of concept with ingress, and then which the ingress just takes the inbound traffic. So egress is just the opposite direction of that, which is taking care of the traffic leaving your network. And with that concept in mind, internet egress gateway is basically an egress that manages traffic going to the internet, uh, public internet. That's so we call it internet egress gateway. Or internet egress gateway. And so now, can you think of any examples of egress in general? Yeah, there are actually many. So controlling egress traffic isn't something new or specific to cloud. It's actually quite a fundamental tech set, and there are many technologies exist to help with that. For example, you may have heard of DNS firewall, AWS Net Gateway or even some open source project like Envoy, Squid Proxy. All of these are egress, or can be used as an egress, but just operating at different level of net network stack. For example, some provide lower uh, level support, like IP-based control, while others can provide more granular L7 control and HTTP host. And each of them have pros and cons. <coughs> So a holistic egress solution often <coughs> combines various of control. For example, we can both have an egress for fine-grained uh, application level control, and then we can also add a DNS firewall for the lower network level control to provide a well-rounded security solution. And today, we are go going to mainly focus on the egress control at the application level. OK, so the next question is, why do we need an internet egress gateway? The first reason on top of our minds is security. So usually when people think about like network security, we will emphasize on the ingress side a lot. However, it turns out securing the traffic leaving your system is also very important. For example, if we encounter some vulnerability issues like log4j, you don't want the attackers to easily execute sensitive data to some malicious websites, right? So if you want to protect your company data for this situation, it's time to really think about adding more control on the egress side as well. <coughs> so therefore, to follow the best practice of defense in depth, we will have multiple layers of access control from traffic entering to leaving our system. So not only ingress, we will build up egress gateway, which will help us prevent any actual access to the public internet, thus the, uh, avoid data execution when the zero is happening. And secondly, monitoring is also a big plus. With the growth in AI area, the emergence of large language models usage, at best, there is an escalating demand for calling external AIs, oh, sorry, APIs these days. So having something to audit and attribute costs associated with such activities become more and more crucial. And we think logs, those logs, metrics provided by an egress gateway is going to be very helpful. Cool. 
Now let's uh, have you, as we have now what's e egress, why do we need an egress? Let's just talk about some high level architecture choices and see how we make the final decision. Uh, sorry, yeah, final decision. Um, just to set up the background a bit for everyone, there are some facts about Airbnb services. Firstly, Airbnb has full adoption with EC proxy for inter service communication. Uh, EC proxy is basically also just running on top of NY, so you can think of it as NY proxy as well. And secondly, to understand your, our use cases, we find out the majority of our outgoing traffic is using HTTPS. And also, we have some requirements for this egress. For example, we want to make the migration of this uh, internet traffic to egress gateway as trans transparent as possible. Specifically, we want to minimize the changes required in the application code. Also, when service owners they try to onboard this egress, we want the toil for them is minimum. Cool. Uh, so after some rounds of exploration, uh, yeah, exploration, we consider this mainly three types of egress architecture. And here, we also want to give a big shout out to Ian Liu and his folks at Lyft, because we got a lot of help from uh, all inspiration from his blog post and the talk. And later I will introduce each of them one by one. But firstly, I also want to just pose three questions. For each of the type of the egress, we, we, we want to think about how do we route inter, uh, internet traffic from the client to the egress? Secondly, when the traffic arrives at the egress, how does the egress know that which is the destination it wants to further route to? And lastly, is the payload end to end encrypted between the client and the destination? I think that will help us uh, memorize this uh, uh, different architectures better. So now, let's take a, the, take a look at the first type of egress. We call it explicit HTTP connect egress. So in this type of uh, egress, we simply will just use connect method in HTTP protocol to let the client send the request through the egress and then further to the destination uh, server. And connect is just a standard HTTP method provided by the web ecosystem, which provides us the native support for routing traffic to your proxy. So to answer the three questions I just posed, yeah, firstly, we just route by instructing the client to send a connect request to the destination. The destination URL will be in the connect uh, request. And yeah, because we explicitly specify the host name of the egress and in a, at the environment variable things. So that will tell the traffic to firstly proxy to uh, gateway and then to the final destination. And how does the uh, egress gateway know about the destination? It's actually in the initial connect request. Uh, the gateway will just, when the, when the traffic arrives at the egress, the egress will just get a de destination from it, and then it will further establish a TCP connection to the destination. So once the initial connect happens successfully, uh, actually connect tunnel will be established between the client and the destination. So, the client will just directly do TLS handshake with the destination, so the payload is actually end-to-end -end encrypted. To summarize this type, uh, the like the yeah the properties of this egress a bit. So this type of egress is powerful because connect method can support various of protocols running on top of it, like HTTP, HTTPS, and SFTP, and so on. And with this architecture, all the routing logic is native handled by connect method, so we don't need to end it up and implement, implement any log routing logic by ourselves. However, the migration won't be transparent because we need to modify the call sites in all of the client codes to, ins to kind of instruct them or construct the uh, connect request to the egress. So the migration is not transparent. And also, this, uh, and also because it requires you to uh, change the application codes and all these clients might be running or using like all these clients might be using different HTTP frameworks and different programming languages so we need to migrate them case by case <clears throat> so and lastly only L4 observability like TCP bytes and connection level metrics are available for this egress gateway because the payload is end-to-end -end encrypted Okay, now let's take a look at the second type we consider, 
which is called transparent egress for HTTPS. We call it transparent because unlike the connect method we saw before, the client doesn't need to know about the egress. It just delegates to a client proxy, which is Istio proxy in our case, to handle the routing transparently. So how does it route? At the client side, we capture the traffic using IP tables and redirect it to the client proxy that's running alongside the application. When the client proxy receives this traffic, it will further route based on a um, catch-all route rule we add, which maps just basically map all the internet traffic to a part uh, on, on port 403 to the egress gateway. And then the client proxy will just originate outer TLS which is issue MTLS in our case, wrap the original request inside and forward them together to the egress gateway. So when the traffic arrives at the egress gateway, the gateway will terminate the outer TLS so that it can inspect the inner HTTPS request. However, we don't actually decrypt the inner HTTPS request. Instead, we just need to look at the server name indication, aka SNI, from the client hello message to know about the original destination. After egress knows about this destination from the SNI, it will then just establish a TCP connection and forward the request to the destination. After this connection is established successfully, then similarly, the client will also just do directly TLS handshake with the destination. So the payload is, end is also end-to-end -end encrypted in this case. So just also to summarize this bit, a bit. So this type of egress only support HTTPS traffic because we need that SNI uh, indicator. And the routing logic is kind of simple because we only just need to add a catch, out, catch all rule in the uh, client proxies. And it doesn't, we doesn't need to touch the application codes everywhere. So the migration is uh, transparent because Airbnb service just as I mentioned before, Airbnb service have been running with an inter, uh, sorry, Istio proxy, so we only need to make the change in the proxy. And lastly, likewise, only L4 level of observability is available. Same reason, yeah. Lastly, we also consider a variation of transparent egress, which is just instead of HTTPS, we support HTTP, plain text HTTP request. So in this case, we also just use the a client proxy to capture the traffic. Uh, however, the difference is that we cannot use a catch all routing because the default port for HTTP is also used by many internal services in Airbnb. So we want to no, we don't want to conflict with those inter service traffic. So in order to route, we we have to maintain some sort of per domain routes, which map each domain and then route them to the egress gateway, and then. Similarly, after the request arrives at the egress, the egress gateway will just terminate the outer TLS originated by the client proxy, and then the egress will just get the destination information by looking at the host header, because that is plain text HTTP, is unencrypted. And after that, the egress will just establish the HTTPS connection and do TLS handshake with the destination on behalf of the client. So in this case, it's clearly that the payload is not end-to-end -end encrypted. So just to summarize this type a bit as well, it only supports HTTP protocol, and there will be some sort of extra toil for the service owner to register each domain for routing. Migration is not transparent. Why? Because as I mentioned before, Airbnb, a lot of majority, the, the majority traffic of uh, our use case is HTTPS. So in order to migrate to this egress, that requires us to downgrade all the existing calls to use plain text HTTP. So that's not transparent. You need to touch the application codes. Um, though this approach is only the one among three that provides us L7 observability, as the egress could inspect the original payload. But this is actually a double-edged sword because that means if it would be riskier if this type of egress is compromised. So considering the balance of easy migration and usage, uh, use case coverage, our final decision is to adopt a hybrid approach, which contains two stages. The first stage is building up the transparent egress for HTTPS, we just mentioned before, and then migrate all the internet traffic on port 403 to it, so that we will quickly gain full observability and control 
uh, on the majority of our outgoing traffic. And at the second stage, we will build up the HTTP Connect egress and then migrate remain non-HTTPS traffic to it. So that's it. And in today's talk, we will focus on the first type of this first type of egress, transparent egress for HTTPS request. And now I will hand over to Akshita to help us make a deep dive. Thanks, Ed, for walking us through the various approaches we considered. Now I will walk. I will help us take a deep dive into one of into the transparent egress for HTTPS. Some of these you might have already caught a glimpse from Ed's description, and we'll take a look at them um, in more depth now. So before that, let's step back. Let's think about what are the key functions that an egress gateway needs to perform. The first one. You might have guessed it already. That's the routing. So the egress gateway needs to know, to be able to route the traffic, it needs to know that what is the host uh, that the client is trying to connect to. So uh, and if you remember, in the transparent egress for HTTPS, the TLS origination happens at the client. You can see that the client is sending HTTPS. So that means the egress gateway cannot look at host level uh, detail like HTTP header level details like the host uh, header. So what is the solution now? Uh, yeah, so the solution is simple. If you remember the basics of a TLS handshake, once the initial connection establishment happens, the client sends the first uh, data packet, which is the client hello. It is in this client hello where the key to our solution lies, and that is the SNI or the server name indication. And this SNI is not encrypted, so it can be inspected by the gateway to know uh, which destination the client is trying to connect to. Great. And now, second function, and my favorite one, is the RBAC, or role-based access control. To understand it simply, think about when you enter your company or organization, you are assigned an ID card. Now, based on this ID, this ID card acts, as, acts like your identity, right? And based on that identity, you are uh, allowed access to certain resources while you are denied access to the others. Similarly, at the egress gateway, a role-based access control means that the egress gateway uh, that the egress gateway allows certain clients to access a fixed set of domains. And in this case, you can see that the client A is allowed access to A.com and example.com, but the client B is allowed access to B.com. If the egress gateway receives any request which is not in this allow list, it will deny it. This is the feature which unlocks the defense in depth uh, security model that we talked about. And this is what makes our outbound traffic secure. We will look at how egress gateway implements the RBAC. So understanding the key functions, let's tiptoe through the life of a request as it starts at the client, goes through the gateway, and reaches its final destination. So here you can see on my left, we have a client which has an application which is trying to access some internet domain. On the right, we have an egress gateway which will act as a proxy for this traffic to reach the internet. Now, there are two key, two key pieces of technology which lighten up our egress gateway. The first is Envoy. So in, as ED mentioned before, at Airbnb, we have full adoption of is, uh, Istio, and which means that we have Envoy proxies running on all our services. These Envoy proxies are the ones which uh, enable our egress gateway functionality. On the client, these Envoy proxies capture the outbound traffic, uh, which originates from the client on port 443, uh, based on the catch-all route that we saw before. And we also have the Envoy proxy running on the gateway on the right. And this Envoy proxy is the one which performs the routing and the RBAC that we saw about before. And now I would like to ask a question. How many of you have worked with network proxies before, used them before, or configured them before? Nice. So now you might be thinking, on network proxies are quite simple, right? You provide them some configuration, and they know how to operate based on that configuration. But uh, in a Kubernetes system, they might not know how to discover uh, the, the other services. So the question comes, 
that how does the envoy running on the client know where the egress gateway is? If the uh, IPs are dynamic, how does it discover them? And here, my friends, is the magician. And that is the mesh control plane. As we, show, so as we have talked about before, we have Istio uh, running in our Kubernetes clusters. And the mesh control plane, which is called Istio D in our case, is the one which enables this uh, service discovery. So specifically for the client, the mesh control plane uh, does two things. First, it, uh, the mesh control plane does two things. First, it enables the service discovery so that client can know what is the, what is the endpoints of the gateway. And second, it configures certificates. If you remember back to my uh, ID, ID example, the, the, the mesh control plane provides the certificates to the client and all services in our mesh. These certificates are the identity that these services can use to interact with other services in the mesh, including the gateway. We will look at how these certificates are used later. And similarly, on the gateway side, uh, the mesh control plane configures the certificates and also enables the rules for routing and RBAC that we saw before. So now our setup is complete. And uh, now when the application sends the request to uh, the internet, the Envoy proxy running on the client captures this traffic and sends it to the gateway uh, after service discovery. One thing to note about this traffic is that the client-side Envoy proxy uh, wraps this traffic around in another layer of TLS uh, and performs mutual TLS with the gateway to keep the intermesh traffic secure. To zoom in on this traffic, you can see on the right that uh, we have the, there's two layer of encryption. One is the one, the yellow one, which is added by the client, and another purple one, which is added by the client proxy. And once this uh, data reaches the gateway, the Envoy proxy on the uh, egress gateway terminates the outer layer of TLS and sends the actual data originated from the client to the internet. So with that, half of our battle is won. The data, <laughs> the data originating from the client has reached the gateway. Now, and now we look at the final piece of the puzzle, which is how does the egress gateway work? So um, before, to understand the gateway a little bit better, We'll take a look at some of the Envoy basics. I know many of you might be quite experts of Envoy, while some of you might be just starting. So I'll try my best to uh, give a very basic overview, which might be helpful to us. So at, a, at its very core, Envoy is a simple network proxy. Uh, as you can see on the left, it binds to some ports and uh, captures data uh, incoming on that port. And on the right, you can see that there's something happens within Envoy, and then the data is sent to the destination. And now, there are two. Uh, let us look at what happens within this white box. I'm sorry, this is not a black box, it's a white box. <laughs> so, the first part of this white box is the listener. As the name suggests, a listener is the one which listens for data. So it binds itself to certain ports and listens to data incoming on that port. And listener is the one which uh, performs a lot of functions that you might be hearing about Envoy, like the RBAC or the rate limiting. And within the listener, we have few fundamental uh, building blocks, which are called filters. And you can think of filters as Legos. And they are the ones which build up a listener and, uh, are, and are chained together to perform the functions of a listener. So within the filters, there are two types of filters. And uh, there is a lot of details about it, but I will uh, summarize it in a short form. So the listener, uh, the first type of listener filters is the listener filters. These filters are the one which execute when Envoy is just accepting the connection and they perform some basic processing uh, on the connection. And then uh, the listener filters, mainly are they, are, they are needed to aid the network filters. And so the next, uh, once the data passes through the listener filters, SSL handshake happens through the TLS transport socket. And then the, the, the 
unencrypted data after the outer TLS termination is available to the network filters. The network filters are the most powerful one parts of a listener. So for example, the RBAC or the rate limiting, all are provided with the help of network filters. A lot of functions we will look at today are examples of network filters. And then once the listener has done its work, it hands it it hands over to uh, the cluster subsystem. Cluster represents everything related to the destination. So, and it's a logical grouping of destination endpoints. So with that, now we are ready to uh, look at the gateway architecture. And we started our exploration of the gateway by uh, a great blog uh, from the folks at IBM. Uh, and I have linked it below, you definitely recommend to read it. So uh, we started with that, and this blog talked about developing a gateway through a two listener model. So we have a mesh listener, an internal listener, and a dynamic forward proxy cluster. We will look at each of them in more detail now. So uh, the first listener, which is the mesh, mesh listener, uh, its its main job, as you can read from its from its name, is to is to read incoming connections from the service mesh. So uh, when it and if you remember the two layers of TLS we had, this mesh listener is the one which receives these two layers of TLS and terminates the outer TLS. And during that process, if you remember the ID card, the certificate we talked about, this mesh listener is the one which looks at the identity presented by the client and extracts it so that the rest of the envoy can, process, can use it. So in our case, the ID is a spiffy identifier highlighted in the red, which, and you can see it, has a, it uh, represents the client A. This ID is important, we will use it for our back. And then, once the mesh listener has done its work, it forwards the request to the internal listener. Now the internal listener is a router. And do you remember what did we need for routing? Yes, the SNI. So the internal listener extracts the SNI through a filter called a TLS inspector, which is a listener filter. And once the SNI is available, our life is simple we are able to, through a combination of filters and the dynamic forward proxy cluster, we are able to forward this request, uh, this data to the destination endpoint. And the SNI dynamic forward proxy list filter and the cluster are really important. Why? Because they allow us that we don't have to register each of the domains like example.com, a.com to Envoy. The, uh, the endpoint resolution can happen dynamically so that our gateway envoy configuration is as simple as possible. So with that, yay, our first function, the routing was working. But my friends, has any engineering project ever worked in the first go? <laughs> Unfortunately not. So if you remember out of the two pieces, the, 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 what was the second piece? It was the RBAC. So with this architecture, the RBAC was not working. So, and we can take a few, look at few of the reasons why. The first reason, if you go back to the allow list, you can see that to be able to perform RBAC, you need to look at the client identity and the upstream server name, both in, at one shot. You cannot look at them at different points uh, in the filter chain and make a complete RBAC decision. So with the two listener system, the client identity is present in the first listener, the SNI is present in the second. So the RBAC filter inserted in either of the places cannot do a complete RBAC. We also explored some strategies around context propagation between the listeners, but that also didn't work for us. And uh, another strategy we tried was to insert the TLS inspector in the, shift the TLS inspector basically to the first listener. And can you guess that if, if the TLS inspector is inserted in the first listener, can it look at the SNI? And I have some hints for you, if you can see the purple box and the yellow box, the SNI is deep within that yellow box and it has that outer layer of encryption. So as you might have already guessed, the TLS inspector in the first listener cannot get the SNI because when it reads the SNI, uh, when it reads the payload in the first listener, 
the MTLS, the outer TLS has not been terminated yet. So this uh, this led to a problem for us. And uh, after many, and during this, we had to read a lot of Envoy code, do a lot of debugging. And uh, during that debugging, we realized there is a more, a more fundamental problem at play here, which is that two listener, my friends, is really, 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 really hard to debug. You can see here, I have the logs from, two, uh, from the first listener and the second listener. And as the data flows across listener, the connection ID of that connection changes. And I have to go through, I have to go through the logs and try to correlate various connection IDs. And for our system, we have, uh, a, con uh, we have a high concurrency at the gateway. Uh, uh, and also, we have a high QPS being served by the gateway. So trying to correlate such a huge amount of logs was a real nightmare. So with that, we uh, finally came to the conclusion that we need to have a simplified system. And, and with many, many iterations later and a lot of help from the open source community, we were able to come up with a final solution. So our final solution, you can see, is a simplified version of the more complex one. You can see we have familiar components, the RBAC filter, the dynamic forward proxy, the dynamic forward proxy cluster, etc. And now we have combined everything, all the scattered information and the scattered filters into a single listener. And you might be thinking how, how we could do that. And that is with the help of a new filter we implemented called the network SNI inspector. This filter derives heavily from the TLS inspector that we saw before with the difference that it can execute at the network filter chain level and it can look at the payload after the outer TLS has been terminated and SSL handshake has completed. So now the network SNI inspector is able to extract the SNI in the first listener. And with that, the SNI and the client identity are both available at together in the first listener. And uh, inserting the RBAC filter, now we can compare the SNI and the client identity against our allow list. And in this case, you can see that the client identity and the based on the allow list, this connection is allowed and the data passes through. And the moment we had been waiting for was when we were able to close a connection, friends. <laughs> so you can see that if there is a, a connection which is not allowed as per the allow list, it will be closed by the RBAC filter. This protects any unexpected connections from happening to the internet and protects our data. And with that, uh, we uh, the our exploration of the egress gateway concluded, and uh, yeah, we are really thankful to the open source community for helping us with that. And as you walk out the door today, I would like you to think about a few things. First, I would like you to explore what is the egress level controls you have within your organization. Are they fine-grained enough and provide a complete uh, security for you? And do you need an egress gateway? And if you decide to go down that road, Envoy is a fun and powerful technology for you to explore, except the debugging sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, we would love to take any questions. And this is the QR code for the feedback for our session. Please help us to provide any feedback you have. Uh, thank you. And take, you can uh, come up to the mic, yeah. please. I had uh, two small questions. Um, why are you double encrypting your traffic in your service mesh? Like the application is running HTTPS and then you're using transparent MTLS. Mm -hmm. why? why we have double TLS in the yeah, first place? Uh, Essentially, it seems like that caused more uh -huh. problems than it solved, where you had to re-implement your filter chains to inspect post. I, I guess it's because in like for all our services, we just have MTLS enabled for like everything. 
So yeah, yeah. that's the setup. That's a security model. We follow that the intermesh traffic. Uh, yeah, we, we use all the intermesh mode. traffic is uh, has a t t extra TLS layer so that if there is any compromise, still like only the server which is receiving the traffic can decrypt it. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes I sense. think Thank there's you. no specific reason. Just yeah. Like yeah. Hi, this is a really uh, great session. Um, Thank you. My question was, um, so like uh, organizations, when they typically use uh, an eager strategy, they like also need things like um, like firewalls or kind of like other like cloud provider tools yeah. to um, like restrict outbound traffic. So um, I was just curious how Airbnb handles that. Like, is that aspect handled? by uh, a different team, or uh, did you also need to uh, focus on those other aspects of like egress management? We actually collaborate, and then other teams will handle like other layers, yeah. Yeah, we do have like firewalls, so, like, so this one, as ED had mentioned, like we al already have uh, some controls at different levels of the network, so this adds a more fine-grained control, but yeah. there's other controls like firewall already at place, yeah, thank you. A great session. Uh, yeah. Question on writing your own Envoy filter. How difficult was it? How long did it take? And probably more importantly, how did you test and verify that um, it wasn't going to cause you problems? Um, yeah, I can answer that. So I think for me, the challenge was that I had to, like, just first, before writing a filter myself, it was it was difficult to learn how Envoy, like how the filter chain actually works, because if you know Envoy is an event-driven uh, code, so it's not obvious that line A, line B, line C it doesn't follow like that. So just uh, took me. It, it, I started with few days of just uh, reading through Envoy code and performing some experiments, reading through the logs, and then once that was done, the filter was quite easy actually. And there are very good blogs about how, uh, like what are the event systems that propagate in Envoy. So we, I can share those offline. And those was really helpful. And once you understand how the filter chain works, writing a new filter is the easier part, I would say. Yeah. Cool. I you. think we can just take one last question, and yes. the session has ended. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the security of the egress filtering appears to be based entirely on SNI inspection. Do you have any worry about SNI uh, and Host header mismatch. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, do, we do have. So that's why we need the second stage of HTTP Connect proxy yes. to handle the cases that is not handled by the first transparent egress. Mm -hmm. Are you? But you said that sometimes both were in place in different items. Like, was that like servers that were known to be to support domain fronting? You switched to HTTP Connect, or that's yeah. Uh, that's can, not okay. yeah so basically uh, I think one of the concerns we have for the future is that there is an effort to encrypt the SNI at the like ha encrypted client hello is also upcoming so yeah the as ED said like we wanted to uh, often in engineering you want to get started with something to get the maximum coverage so we started with this SNI based approach and like in future once we have the HTTP connect and we have a good good observability over our traffic we will be like using the HTTP connect so, to solve those worries so yeah your long term plan is to move yes. entirely to connect yes cool cool thanks everyone thanks everyone yeah. and oh, we didn't say